of our four-part series in, entitled uh, Demystifying Probate and Estate Planning um, here at the Noah Webster Library. Again, thank you for coming. As you may know, all of these sessions have been well attended. As, as you can see tonight, they're standing room only, and that's, that's how they all have been. So it's been wonderful. Thank you for your attendance. Um, as uh, uh, they said, I'm Owen Egan. I am uh, the West Hartford Judge of Probate. This session is entitled Estate Taxation and the Use of Trusts. Uh, by the time you uh, leave here today, it is my hope that you will have a basic understanding about estate taxation and the use of trusts. Uh, do, do not try this at home on your own. You have to consult with experts like the panelists that are here today. Um, in all serious, seriousness, uh, please consult with your lawyer or, as I said, one of the panelists who have been here today or, or who were here previously. Um, the, the, uh, before we start, I want to thank West Hartford Library for co-sponsoring this event with me. A special thanks goes to Maura Boudreau. I don't know if Maura's here. But thank you, Maura. I want to just thank her and, and give her a hand. She's put all this together. <laughs> Um, and then also uh, a special thanks to Morris co-worker Rebecca Nugent who just uh, announced me uh, for helping as well. So thank them both. I appreciate it. Uh, I would also like to thank Jen Evans and her team from Channel 5 for being so kind to tape this event. So th thank them. It will be aired on WHC-TV uh, and they have been wonderful. They've been here for every session. So we're, we're lucky to have them. How about a round of applause for them? <laughs> Uh, you'll be hearing from uh, two accomplished attorneys tonight, and you're in for a great program. Uh, I want to thank Richard Marone. I thanked him every evening. He, he, he doesn't know it. Uh, Rich was the former chairperson of the estate and probate section of the Connecticut Bar Association, and Rich helped uh, to bring together this great panel for all four sessions. And uh, we're lucky to have Rich here tonight to address the issues of uh, uh, estate taxation and the use of trusts. By way of, of background, attorney Richard Marone is a graduate of the College of William and Mary Law School. He also received a graduate degree in taxation uh, from Boston University Law School. Attorney Marone has over 35 years experience in the area of probate, estate planning, trusts, and estates. Attorney Marone currently serves as the chair of the uh, Trusts and Estate Department at Mirtha uh, Kalina, a law firm in Hartford. And Attorney Marone is the past state chair of the Connecticut chapter of the American College of Trust and Estate Council. Attorney Marone has also served as certified probate and trust dispute mediator by the American College of Trust and Estate Council. Uh, next, we have Heather Rhodes, who's seated next to, to Richard. And uh, Attorney Rhodes is a graduate of University of Connecticut School of Law. She has approximately 20 years of experience in tr uh, probate, trust, and estate area. She is a principal in the law firms of Cummings and Lockwood uh, and the partner in charge of the West Hartford office. She practices in the area of estate planning, estate settlement, trust administration, and charitable planning. She is also a member of the firm's national charitable planning group. She has published many articles, including her most recent article entitled Substantiating Charitable Deductions at the IRS which was published in the Trust and Estate magazine in July of 2017. Both are experts in their field. They're well respected by their colleagues and in the Connecticut probate courts at large. By volunteering their time and by volunteer, the, the volunteers who also uh, came before them and after, um, they, they're doing a wonderful uh, community service for the town of West Hartford. By my count, after all four sessions are completed, they will have invested about $100,000 of their legal time preparing for this and then also speaking at, at each of these sessions. So it's a, a wonderful gift to West Hartford and a tribute. These attorneys are, are, are very, very kind. Uh, the probate court system, for, for those of you who, who haven't been here, I'll give you a little history. The probate court system started in, in America and it's existed since uh, about 300 years ago. Uh, during colonial times. Originally, there were four probate courts in the state of Connecticut. There was one in Hartford, one in New Haven, one in New London, and one in Fairfield. Our court of West Hartford broke away from Hartford in uh, 1982 when we established our own court here. Uh, before that, our citizens had to go to Hartford to have their matters adjudicated. Uh, the probate courts handled small, a small number of matters back 
back when there were only four courts, and they only did decedents, estates, and guardianships. But over time, the jurisdiction has dramatically increased. And, and today, the probate courts deal with a wide variety of matters uh, that affect, uh, affect the lives of Connecticut citizens from birth until death. Um, for instance, some of you might be familiar with the fact that the decedents' estates are processed in the probate court. That would be the administration of someone's estate after they die and, and the, and the uh, disposition of assets after someone passes. It's too loud. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but the court also handles adoptions. It handles guard guardianships. It handles uh, issues for uh, uh, name changes, termination of parental rights, commitment hearings for people who have psychiatric disabilities, and uh, also commitment hearings for people who need treatment who have uh, drug and alcohol issues. And the court, the list goes on. We're a creature of statute, and the court handles all of those areas that the legislature dictates or, or delegates to, to the court. Um, if you have not been to the probate and court in West Hartford, please come and visit. Our court is a people-friendly court. Um, all of the staff have been there for many years, more years than I've been there. They're, they're, they have uh, a great amount of experience and they're all willing to help. Um, the staff is led by Lori Rico, who is the, the chief clerk and she's, ha she's got 30 years experience. The next clerk has about 29 years of experience, 23 years for the next and so forth. Um, and they're very kind and they're very sensitive to people who walk through the doors. They know that uh, the issues that come before them are very delicate, that people are vulnerable. They're in a state where they've lost someone or they're looking to have someone conserved who has some incompetency issues. And it's, it's generally a very, very uh, sensitive time for that person. And our staff is all kind and very, very, very sensitive to, to the issues of the people who walk through the door. So they're, they're willing to help. But if you just want to come by and see the court, you can do that and you can attend a hearing. The hearings, most of them are public and you can attend uh, the hearings most and all of the files except for a few are public. You can view those files uh, as well. So um, please, please stop by. Um, our offices are located in the town hall uh, just across the way. They're on the second floor and the, the uh, clerk's office is open from 8.30 until 4.30 Monday through Friday. The court handles its matters in the council chambers directly across from the clerk's office. It's a very beautiful room. The, the town is kind enough to let us use that, so all our matters are handled there. And the matters are not handled in, in a way like you, you would handle a matter in superior court or in federal court. You sit at a table, a conference table, and while sometimes the rules of evidence apply and, and, and we have full-blown hearings, it, it's in a more relaxed setting than it would be in the superior court or in the federal court. Uh, so again, I invite you to please, please stop by. Um, for additional materials, we've handed out some materials to you. You can pick up other materials in the probate court. We have plenty of, of informational guidelines that, that uh, the clerk will provide you, but there's additional materials on our website and then also on uh, the website for the probate court administrator, which is www.ctprobate.gov. Again, I'll repeat it. It's www.ctprobate.gov, and you can find a lot of helpful information there. Um, so if you browse in there, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll be happy to see all the forms and, and guides that they'll give you. Uh, tonight, we are here to learn about estate taxation and the use of trusts. This is a very important topic. To frame the issue, I want to tell you a brief story about a nice couple that, that uh, I had encountered in my practice and they failed to do proper estate planning for whatever reason, be it they were worried uh, about the cost of an attorney or that they, they simply just didn't get around to it, which often happens. People, they just don't get around to it. They think, I'll do it another day. Um, and this, this couple, they were married for uh, quite a long time. They had three children. Um, the uh, husband died and left everything to his wife by will. Their wills were identical. Um, they did their wills about 20 years before. Uh, they left everything, husband to wife, wife to husband, and then to their children in equal shares. Um, the, wife, the wife died shortly after the husband died, probably about a year after the husband died. Um, the first transfer of assets from the husband to the wife, there was no tax. There was not a problem there. The transfer from the wife to the children, 
The estate consisted of about three million, maybe a little more than three million dollars. Um, caused her to incur a $100,000 tax to the state of Connecticut. And so that could have been avoided, and the panelists here tonight will educate you and, and tell you a little bit about that. But it requires proper planning, and, and you need to see an attorney, and you need to follow up with that attorney every few years, maybe every three or four years, which I think they'll also, uh, they'll also tell you about. So um, this was a very unfortunate uh, for, for this family because that $100,000 could have gone to their children. Instead, it went to the state of Connecticut. And I, don't, I don't have anything against the state of Connecticut, <laughs> but I, I, I think it would have been nice to have it go to the kids. Um, so you can see why estate taxation and the use of trust is a very important topic. Um, so now, without further ado, we'll, we'll hear from our panelists. Um, I'm going to ask one, one favor, if you would please hold your questions until after both have spoken. We'll, take, uh, we'll, we'll give you each the opportunity to ask questions at the end, and um, we'll take up those questions one at a time, and we'll make sure that everybody has a chance to, to ask their question. Um, first, we're going to hear from Heather Rhodes. Heather? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Is that too loud? Okay. Is it loud enough? Okay. Just feedback. If it's not good, just tell me. So we're going to be using the same handout that you've seen in the past two sessions with the family structure. And Rich is actually going to get into the family structure in a minute. We've only changed the fact pattern slightly, so Rich will point out a couple things that we made changes to with respect to the assets, but the family um, is there with Alan and Susan, just like you've seen in the past. So as Judge Egan said, we're here in the third program in the series of four to talk about estate planning and elder law. So the first session walks through the probate court system, how it works, what's kind of included in, this, in an estate and what has to be done I know the second session touched on basic estate planning, wills, powers of attorney, and living wills. So today's program, we kind of want to bring all that together and talk about this estate taxation and the use of trust to try to maximize the estate tax exemption that everyone is given by the government, both the IRS and the state of Connecticut. So the estate plan really covers three periods of time it can help you plan and manage your assets in the event you become incapacitated. It can then transfer assets to your beneficiaries in a tax efficient way. And finally, it can protect assets that you leave to your family members as beneficiaries from creditors looking to take assets from those beneficiaries. So we're gonna kind of look at that whole scope tonight. So I'm gonna start off by focusing on really what is a trust, how does it work, who's involved in it, and then Rich is going to come up and talk about estate taxes and using trust to maximize those estate tax exemptions and look at the family scenario that we have in the handout. Then I'm going to look at why would people use trust to protect their family members? What are the, what are the ways we can protect family with trust? And then finally Rich is going to talk about who should the trustee be and what are those trustees need to be doing? What are their duties? So first, looking at a trust, well, what is a trust? It's simply a legal arrangement between three parties. So we have three parties within this trust structure. The first one is the grantor, the person who creates the trust. That person also may be called a set lower, a trustor, a donor. So there's many terms for that person. We use the term grantor in our law firm, but it really means the person who's setting up or creating the trust. Then you have the trustee. That's either the, a person or an entity, you know, for example, a bank or trust company, that is responsible for managing the property that's owned by the trust. And that trustee is also responsible for making decisions on making distributions of assets to the beneficiaries of the trust. So that's the third person involved in the trust, the beneficiary. And the beneficiary is the person or the entity. For example, you could have a charity be a beneficiary. 
those are the people or entities that are entitled to receive assets from the trust over time. So commonly that could be your children or other family members would be the beneficiaries of a trust that you created for them. So the grantor or the creator of the trust sets up this legal arrangement and then transfers property into the trust to be managed and taken care of by the trustee for the benefit of the beneficiaries. The trust can either be created during your lifetime or upon your death. So if, it's, if you've set up a trust during your lifetime, that's called, you may have heard of a living trust or an inter vivos trust, which just means a living trust. So that's we a trust. To throw the Latin in there. We, just to be cool. <laughs> so, so that's a trust that you've created during your lifetime that exists and is effective during your lifetime. The other type of trust is what's called a testamentary trust. I don't have a Latin for that, Rich, do you? <laughs> um, so that's a trust that you create under your will. So that trust you've set up under your will, but it doesn't spring into being until you pass away. And then that trust will hold property once you've passed away. So that's called a testamentary trust. A trust created under a will, a testamentary trust, is subject to the probate court supervision for the period of time there are assets in the trust. So because the will is subject to probate court jurisdiction and supervision, that means any trust created under your will are also subject to probate court oversight for the time that the trust exists. And that means the trustee will need to report to the probate court every few years about what's going on with the trust what income has come in, what distributions has the trustee made, that type of thing will need to be shown every few years to the probate court. Contrast that to a trust that you've created during your life, this inter vivos or living trust. That's an agreement that you've made between you as the grantor, the trustee you've picked, and the beneficiaries who get to receive the property. That does not involve probate court supervision because that is done in a separate document in a trust agreement and not under your will. So for example, if you passed away, that trust would go on for the benefit of the beneficiaries and would not necessarily be subject to this probate court supervision that would be true of a trust under your will. Trust can also be revocable or irrevocable. And I'm sure many of you heard people are setting up revocable living trusts. So that is a trust that is changeable at any time, right? So revocable, you can change the provisions or you can get rid of it altogether. And a revocable living trust, you are setting that trust up. You're the grantor. You can change the trust at any time. You can also be your own trustee and the beneficiary during your lifetime. So it's really a trust for your benefit while you're alive and you can manage it while you're not incapacitated. So you're in complete control of your revocable living trust while you have capacity. Once you set up your revocable living trust, you can transfer assets to the trust by changing, for example, the deed to your residence into the name of the trust or your bank accounts into the name of the trust. The trust is for your benefit and you're the trustee. So there's no change to kind of your daily living. But if you did become incapacitated, your revocable living trust would have already named someone as the successor trustee to you who would take over managing your assets if you were unable to do so. So this is that kind of idea that your revocable living trust can help you manage your assets in the event you become incapacitated because you've already predetermined the next trustee in line who steps up and takes your place and can handle the assets as you would have if you were able to do so. Once you become incapacitated or upon your death, that revocable living trust becomes irrevocable because you were the only one who had the right to change it. And so after you're gone or in the event you're incapacitated, you can no longer change it, it becomes irrevocable. There are also other types of trusts that are irrevocable from the beginning, from when you create them during your lifetime. I think those are beyond the scope of today, um, but suffice it to say those are used to reduce estate taxes for some more sophisticated estate tax planning. 
today we're really going to focus on using the revocable living trust to maximize the estate tax exemptions. So if you do create your revocable living trust during your lifetime and transfer assets into it, then upon your death, those assets are not subject to the probate court process. So they will not be probated to then pass on to the beneficiaries because your trust is still living, it still exists, and it is the owner of those assets. So upon your death, the successor trustee will just step in and follow what the trust says about where the assets should go. In comparison, if you own assets in your sole name, and I know this was touched on in the previous sessions, at your passing, those assets pass under your will through probate to then pass on to the beneficiaries. So the distinction here is what if assets are owned by your trust at your death, those do not have to kind of flow through that probate pop process to pass to the beneficiaries. That can be very helpful, for example, if you own real estate in a state other than your domicile state. So if you are a resident of Connecticut and you own real estate in a state other than Connecticut, at your death, your executors will have to go to that state and probate the real estate. So you could potentially have multiple probates in multiple states. So many times we advise our clients who own real estate in other states to title those properties in your revocable living trust because at your death, the trust can then just manage the property and the executors don't have to go there and probate the property in that state. So that can be very beneficial if you have out-of-state real estate. In addition to putting assets in the revocable living trust while you're alive, you can also have a will, which many of you have heard the term pour over will. It's a will that says, upon my death, take any assets that I own and add them to my revocable living trust. So if you haven't already added them while you're alive, your will can take everything else and put them in your trust at your death. The will is a public document, I know you've learned, when you pass away, and that is on file with the probate court. So for people concerned with privacy, this simple pour over will that says just leave all my assets to my trust appeals to them because all of the dispositive provisions about who gets what and the trust for children or other family members, those, all those dispositive provisions are in your revocable living trust, which is a private document. And the only public document would be this very simple will that doesn't really have any of the dispositive provisions in it. So this privacy idea is a benefit of having a pour over will to a revocable living trust. So the revocable trust really is serving two roles. It manages your affairs in the event you're incapacitated, so anything's owned by the trust as we talked about, a successor trustee can step in and manage. And then it also disposes of your assets upon your death to your beneficiaries. And we all hear, I, I know Rich and I see clients who say, well, I've heard we want to you know, avoid probate. And that's, you know, we explain to clients that that's not always a good idea. You may actually want probate. Probate is a good thing. There may be many family, family situations or other circumstances that are very much helped by the probate court and the probate process. Whether there's disagreement among family members or assets that need to be supervised, that may be something that's very helpful to have a probate court and the probate judge overseeing that. The probate court does charge a set fee for every estate, and that fee is set by, set by Connecticut statute. It's the same fee regardless of whether assets need to be probated or not. And, and please don't blame, blame us or the judge. That's set by <laughs> Connecticut statute. Um, it's a graduated scale. And for example, on a $2 million estate, if you're leaving all the assets to children, you don't have a surviving spouse, it's about a $5,500 fee. There's credits and it's complicated if you have a surviving spouse. But, but so there's this set fee fixed by statute for every estate, whether or not there are probate assets that need to get probated. The good news is there's a $40,000 cap. This was big news for the, the Bar Association. Um, on an, about a, a $9 million estate, the probate fee is capped at $40,000. So, um, so over that, everyone would pay, would pay the same on larger estates. 
So Rich, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you wanna to touch on estate taxes and our family. Sure. Thank you and thank you everyone for coming. It's good to see you all here. Um, your handout has the same family that uh, has appeared at every one of these seminars. Um, so, you know, Heather will get a little later into talking about Richard the black sheep, no relation to me, <laughs> um, and what trust could do to save him from himself and other things like that. Um, I also want to refer you to the next page, which lists the family assets. Now, here we made a few changes because, frankly, we're here to talk about the impact of estate taxes. And so we needed to have a family that had enough assets to cause an estate tax problem, potentially. So the, the only difference here, um, and I could ask for somebody who's astute and could point it out, but I'll just tell you, <laughs> that in, we gave each of Alan and Susan $500,000 of life insurance instead of $50,000 of life insurance. So that's the big change here. Um, and that pushes their total assets to 2.675 million. And that's significant for estate tax purposes. And the reason is that an estate tax taxes the passage of wealth from you to your beneficiaries in any fashion whether it passes to them jointly, you know, you had it jointly titled so they inherit it that way, or whether you name them as a beneficiary on a life insurance policy or a retirement account, or whether you set up a will or a trust that says, on my death, these people are entitled to benefit from my estate plan. Um, any of that is the passage of your wealth, and that is potentially subject to the estate tax system both federally and in any state either where you're domiciled or where you have real property, a house or something like that. And we'll get into that in a little more detail. So the federal estate tax system tends to be where the conversation starts because it, if it applies to you, it has the biggest impact. And the reason it has the biggest impact is that if it applies to you, it applies at 40% of the value of what passes from you to other people. And that's a big number. So if one of your children, let, well, let's put it this way. We go back to Alan and Susan. Let's say Alan had already died and Susan had inherited everything here. Susan's estate would be almost $2.7 million dollars and if estate tax applied from dollar one, she'd be looking at probably a million, or I didn't do the math in my head, but a million dollars of estate tax. That's a big number. Now, luckily, um, the federal system gives everybody a couple of tools to work with. So one is, uh, you heard it mentioned before by the judge, the ability to leave everything to your spouse without incurring an estate tax. So we call that the unlimited marital deduction, which sounds like a wonderful idea at first blush, but may not be the best planning scenario. Um, the other thing that the, the, the federal estate tax gives everybody is an exemption, meaning that there's an amount of wealth that can pass from a person to anybody other than their spouse, at least outright, that will not be subject to estate tax. And that amount is thankfully quite high. <clears throat> this year, it's $5,490,000. And it goes up by an inflation adjustment. Um, so that's quite a bit of wealth, right? So a lot of people say, well, if you, you know, if we look at Alan and Susan, they add their wealth together and they say, well, even if one of us leaves everything to the other, when the other dies with 2.7 million, say, we won't have a federal estate tax because we're underneath the 5.49 million. 
So fine, no 40% federal estate tax. Um, and the other thing that the federal system allows is something called portability, which is everybody's ability to take their unused exemption and give it to their spouse. So in, in the case where Alan died and left everything to Susan, even if the estate was more than $5.49 million, Susan's estate would be okay because she could actually have 11 more or less million dollars to pass to their kids without an estate tax because Alan would have ported his unused exemption to Susan. Okay. So federal estate tax, not a big impact on many people, although if you're wealthy, you need to worry about it. Um, and just as an aside, the other thing that's not subject to estate tax is dispositions to charities. So no estate tax on that, thankfully. Now, the, the big deal for Alan and Susan is going to be Connecticut estate tax. Um, because just about every state except Florida and maybe a few others have an estate tax that applies at the state level. Um, and in Connecticut, it's structured very much like the federal estate tax, except, of course, it's at a much lower rate. Um, but also, the exemption is much lower. So, whereas the federal exemption was $5.49 million, the Connecticut exemption is a flat $2 million. It's not subject to inflation adjustment and you can't port it to your surviving spouse. So that's really where a lot of the planning that we do these days focuses, because you can leave an unlimited amount of your assets to your spouse and get an unlimited marital deduction, just like for federal purposes. But then if, like Alan and Susan, if Susan had $2.675 million when she died, it would be subject to Connecticut estate tax. And at the back of your packet, uh, there are two charts, one of which shows you the state of the federal exemption. But the last page is what I would have you focus on, which is the Connecticut estate tax chart. So you see there that uh, the first $2 million passes with no tax from Susan to her kids. But over 2 million and up to 3.6 million, there's 7.2% of that excess is the Connecticut estate tax. So if you think about it, 7.2% of 675,000 would be the estate tax on Susan's estate to the state of Connecticut. And that would be what? four or five hundred thousand. I don't do the math in my head anymore. Um, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of money. Okay, well, like I said, I don't do the math in my head. So a hundred thousand. Um, so, um, so what can be done about that? Well, if you, if you think about it, the goal of the planning for somebody in Connecticut we talk to them about how not to waste the first spouse's Connecticut estate tax exemption when the first spouse passes away because there's no portability. You know, if there were portability, you could say the surviving spouse has $4 million without estate tax, but we don't have that here. And in fact, I'm not sure that any state has that to no. my knowledge. No. Um, so, the goal of planning for Alan and Susan, if they had come to us before anybody died, would be how do we set aside up to $2 million of assets from the first spouse so that they're available to the second spouse during his or her lifetime survivorship, but not so available or controlled, right, that the tax system considers the survivor to be the owner of it. Because if you own it, it's subject to tax in your estate. 
if you benefit from it, but you don't control it or own it, then it's not going to be taxed in your estate as the surviving spouse. So as you may guess by the title of this program, the way to do that is with a trust. So um, let's say Alan dies. We always pick on the guys for some reason. <laughs> We always make them die we first. Do. <laughs> so depending upon how Alan and Susan split up the ownership of their assets, but no matter who died first, but let's say Alan died first and he has, it looks like, about $425,000 of separately owned assets. And we might, in fact, uh, recommend that the couple also split up so that one house is owned by one and one house is owned by the other, rather than having them owned jointly. And so let's just say that would give Alan separately owned property of about 800,000 or, or in that neighborhood. So if Alan died first and his will poured his estate over to his revocable living trust like Heather described, and if that revocable trust had a formula in it that said, up to $2 million passing from Alan, put that into this trust for Susan. And she will be the primary beneficiary of it. She can get distributions in the discretion of the trustees. She could even be the only trustee, although later we'll talk about why she might not want to be the only trustee. Yet, so she can benefit from it almost as much as she could benefit from it if Alan just gave it to her. But when she passes away, she doesn't own it. So the estate tax does not apply to that in her estate. And so just by taking that simple step, that couple saved $100,000 in estate tax. Okay. I'm sure that later on you'll have some questions about that, um, and we can go through it again or talk in a little more detail about that. Um, but that's the general notion of taking advantage of your federal, uh, your Connecticut estate tax exemption on the first spouse's death, and not just leaving everything to the surviving spouse. And that's probably the toughest part of the conversation. Mm -hmm that we face is telling people, don't leave it all to your <laughs> spouse. But once we get done talking about why, most people will say, well, that gets me close enough to you know, what I'm comfortable with that I'm willing to do that for the tax savings. Now, I just want to also mention that lots of people own homes in other places condos in Florida, houses on the Cape, whatever it might happen to be. So the way state estate taxes work, as opposed to federal, because federal taxes you on anything you own, wherever you own it, even if you have a chalet in Switzerland. But each state can only tax you on your wealth, your intangible wealth, money, stocks, bonds, that kind of thing, if you're domiciled there, and your real estate that's located there. So Alan and Susan live in Connecticut. If one of their houses was on Cape Cod instead of in Old Lyme, Connecticut could tax all of their brokerage accounts and joint bank accounts and retirement accounts, but not their Cape Cod house. But Massachusetts <clears throat> could tax their Cape Cod house when they die, but nothing else. So the important thing is that if you own assets in multiple states, you need to worry about the estate taxes in multiple states and how those are going to interact when somebody passes away. And now I'll turn it back over to Heather to talk about specifically how trusts can then come into play when the second spouse passes away and what they're good for in terms of protecting kids and grandkids.
So now we're going to talk about Richard. I think we've picked Richard. I don't, I'm not sure if it's because we don't like his look today. I'm not sure. But he's going to be the black sheep of the family in, in today's scenario. So in thinking about why people would use trust for their children and grandchildren, we talk with clients about risks, right? So there's external risks that the child or grandchild is going to be exposed to during their lives after you're gone. But there's also internal risks created by that child or grandchild. And leaving assets in a protected trust for that child or grandchild is a way to protect those assets after you're gone so that a creditor of that child or grandchild can't reach in and take them. So it's really a way that you can leave this legacy and protect your beneficiaries after you're gone. So if, I, if we were sitting down talking with Alan and Susan about once, they're, once they've passed, well, how do they want their children to inherit? And I think Rich and I see a, a lot of clients think, well, I don't need trust for the children. You know, they're, they're of age. They can manage the assets. You know, I trust them. And so then, you know, we start talking about, well, kind of what are the risks? And, and in Alan and Susan's case, well, maybe Richard, there are some internal risks that he may have a substance abuse problem. He may have what we call spendthrift tendencies. You know, a child or grandchild who, who spends money frivolously, who you're worried about won't save enough money or won't um, keep enough money to pass it on to their children or care for their children. Sadly, Richard may have, Rich and I laughed about this, bad driving, bad driving skills, right? Without enough insurance. Not Maybe me, or not not, me. Not, not, not you, Richard. Um, or, you may be concerned, well, what if your child becomes incapacitated and someone needs to manage his or her, his or her assets in a trust? Or so, already is. Or already is incapacitated, exactly, has a disability and can't manage the assets if you were going to leave them to him or her. So those are what we call kind of internal risks. There are also external risks that all of you are aware of. A divorcing spouse becomes very common today. We talk to a lot of clients about you know, I want to leave assets to my children, but I don't necessarily want them to be taken by a divorcing spouse after I'm gone. I want to kind of protect the bloodline. So that's a very common one where with a properly drafted trust, assets can be protected and not reachable by a divorcing spouse. The child or grandchild may also be in a profession that creates a risk of lawsuit, you know, malpractice, whether it be a doctor, lawyer, you may want to be able to, to protect assets that you're leaving to that person that won't be able to be exposed to creditors that are suing that child or grandchild. They may have start a business, get in bad business deals. Again, assets can be protected in a properly drafted trust so that if that child or grandchild gets sued for a bad business decision, the creditor can't come in and take the assets that you've left to that child. Now that's very different from the child's own assets. So Connecticut is a state that says you can't put your own assets in a trust, retain use of them, and protect them from your own creditors. As Rich said, if you can, if, if you can use the asset, then it'll be taxed. Also, if you can use the asset, it will, can be reached by your creditors. But this is a unique way that you can leave assets in trust for a child or grandchild or other beneficiary and protect them because they're not that child's asset, they're assets that you've left to that child in this particular way. So it's a unique way that you can actually protect assets from creditors of a beneficiary. Another benefit that I find clients like about a trust structure involves kind of protecting the bloodline again. So for example, if you set up trust for your children at your death, the trust could last for the children's lifetime. So here in the example for Richard, he can receive income from the trust for his lifetime. But upon his death, let's say, you may want to make sure if he has children, I know he doesn't yet, we should have picked on Jennifer for that, <laughs> for that part, um, that the assets pass on to Richard's children. So again, protecting kind of down the bloodline. Richard's not free to leave those assets to a spouse, let's say, who may get remarried and leave the assets you know, to somebody else. So there's this idea of staying in the bloodline, generational planning that these trusts allow you to, to do and to manage your assets in that way. So when creating a trust, whether it's to protect a child's 
from his or her creditors or to maintain the assets down the bloodline, the key to the trust is really who you name as the trustee because that's the person who's going to be in charge of the assets, going to be controlling them over time and who you are trusting to make decisions as you would. So, Rich, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about who those people can be and what they do. Let me go back to one thing, which is, you know, it may be confusing for us to when we say, well, these assets are for you or they go to you and sometimes they're protected and sometimes they're not, right? So we have to go back to the notion that if you own them, you're taxed on them and they can be taken away from you, either in a divorce or a lawsuit if you lose it or whatnot, or you can just, you know, have bad habits and give them all away or, you know, drink them all away or do whatever. We see it, we see it all in our practices. Um, and usually we see it kind of when it's too late. Like Heather said, sometimes, you know, the clients will come in and they'll say, yeah, the kids, you know, they're 40 and they're fine. You know, I, I trust them all. And then you start talking about okay, well, this could happen, and that could happen, and that could happen, and then, and then they want to run screaming from the room because, you know, but, but it's our job to sort of say, you know, we talk about the possibilities, not the probabilities. So your kids may be completely upstanding citizens, but that doesn't mean they won't get sued or they won't get a divorce, you know. So, but then, so how can an asset be in, in trust for the benefit of somebody, but not be owned by them. Well, that's the whole point, right? So if, and I'm gonna talk about essentially two things. So one is, if you appoint someone else as the trustee of the trust, for Richard in this case, for example, and the only way that Richard can get something is if that other trustee says, okay, here's something from this trust, then Richard doesn't have the right to take it, so it's not his for tax purposes, and it's not his for lawsuit purposes or divorce purposes, right? Now, sometimes we want to say, or clients want to say, you know, I really like that feature, but I don't want him to have to go ask some lawyer or some bank or whatever every time he needs some money. So I don't like that idea. Can't he be his own trustee? And so we say a qualified yes. What does that mean? So you can be your own trustee. So now we're talking about wearing all kinds of multiple hats here. You can be your own trustee, but your ability to distribute to yourself has to be limited by words that mean something under the law of trusts. And those words are health, education, support, and maintenance. And you know what they mean is kind of what you would think they mean, food, clothing, medical care, housing, transportation, what we would call the stuff of daily living, right? So if you, as trustee, can only make a distribution to yourself as beneficiary for health, education, support, and maintenance, then you are not considered to be the owner of that trust, so you are not taxed on the asset when you die, and it's not available if you get sued or get divorced right now. So that sounds great, but you know, if you're the only one in charge, and you're doing everything for your own benefit, a couple things happen. One is, it's easy to start getting sloppy with the formalities, right? You just give it to yourself because you say you need it for your health or your education or whatever. But, you know, you're the only one that really knows, right? And so if you're the only one that really knows, then there are plenty of other smart lawyers who want to get at that trust to say, well, you didn't treat it like a trust. You, know, you treated it like your own. So we're not going to respect that trust. We're going to ask a judge to break it and give it to us. 
Um, so what, what we tend to talk about, you know, is having multiple trustees in a circumstance like that. Um, because if I am, I'm not this Richard, but if I were this, if we say Richard can be a co-trustee of his own trust, but we're going to name XYZ Trust Company or you know, the law firm, the lawyer we've been working with forever or my college roommate who's in the financial services business, we're gonna name that person or entity as a co-trustee. You gain some independence and credibility and accountability with that especially since we would go one step further and say when there's a co-trustee like that, the co-trustee has to make the decision to distribute for the benefit of the beneficiary co-trustee, right? So by being a trustee of your own trust, you know everything that's going on, you can participate in how the assets are invested, but you can't make a decision to take the assets out for yourself, the other trustee has to make that decision. And that buys you a lot of protection from the risks that Heather talked about. Okay. Now, what do trustees do anyway? And who should you think about having as a trustee? Um, well, you've probably heard the term fiduciary duties. And those are the duties that a trustee has um, to the trust and to the beneficiaries. So there's, there's a lot of them. There's the duty to be careful, you know, to be prudent. Don't go out and buy an oil well with the entire trust, right? Not a good idea. Um, you have a duty to make the assets productive because the beneficiaries, if you say in your trust that the beneficiaries are entitled to get distributions for health and education and support and maintenance, then you have a duty to make sure the assets produce some income to do that with, in addition to being able to distribute principal. There's also a duty of loyalty. Your trustee in that role has a duty to the trust beneficiary. So that trustee couldn't come along and say, wow, you know, there's an opportunity here, and instead of investing the trust assets prudently in it, I'm going to take trust assets and I'm going to invest them in my own business venture. Not, not good. Breach of the duty of loyalty. There's also the duty of confidentiality. So your trustee can't go to a cocktail party and say, guess what's in this trust I'm administering for my neighbor, Joe. Right? Can't do that. Um, and, of course, there's a duty to follow the law of trusts and to follow what the trust agreement says because the trust agreement really establishes the rules of the road in terms of what the trustee can do. And the trustee can't go off and do something different. They have to follow what the trust says. And finally, there's a duty of impartiality. So the trustee, for example, of Alan and Susan's trust for David, Jennifer, and Richard can't say that Richard is a, uh, he's a terrible guy, so we're just going to make all the distributions to you know the other two. Now, there may be a good reason to do that if Richard has got risks that are pressing on his wealth. But all things being equal, if everybody's just fine, the trustee can't decide they just, they're not going to distribute to Richard just because he always wears blue jeans and tank tops and sandals when he comes to the office. You can't do that. Um, so trustees primarily have to do three things. They have to invest the assets to make them productive. They have to make sure tax returns get filed because a trust pays income tax just like you do, uh, slightly different system but the same idea. You earn income, somebody's got to pay tax on it, so a tax return has to be filed. Um, and the most important part is working with your beneficiaries to determine what is the right distribution to make to them according to the trust agreement standards, 
and what is not the right thing to give them according to the trust agreement standards. And that ability to say no is one of the most important things you would want to evaluate in picking who you would like to be as a trustee of the trust you create for your family members. Um, because it's easy to say yes. You know, that's, you come, you get hounded by these kids. Every week they want money for this, money for that, and the easy thing is to say, yeah, sure, just here, I'll give it to you. But a good trustee knows when and how to say no. That's not what this is about, you know. So that's important. Now, we talked a little bit about having co-trustees for protection purposes, you know, so that nobody can say you control everything and there's no trust here. Um, but sometimes people like to have trustees who have different skill sets. So, you know, you might say, well, um, for example, my sister would be the best trustee for my children because she understands them, they grew up with their aunt, you know, there's a really close bond there, she'll know what they need. But you may also say, I'm not sure my sister wouldn't go out and invest in an oil well. You know? So sometimes people will say, well, I'm gonna make my sister a co-trustee because she knows what the beneficiaries need and I'm gonna pick a professional as the other co-trustee because they'll know how to keep the records, how to get the investment advice, how to run it like it's supposed to be run, and together they'll do everything I want to be done for my beneficiaries. Um, the other thing that having a co-trustee can do for you is you can give that other trustee the ability to go beyond those words we used before, health, education, support, and maintenance. So if you're your own trustee, you can't have the ability to make distributions for anything other than that stuff of daily living. But if you pick another trustee, you can say, you know what, that other trustee alone can distribute to my beneficiaries for any reason that the trustee decides is for their benefit. And that's a pretty powerful way to add flexibility to a trust. And the biggest complaint people always had with trust is that they're not flexible. Well, that's a way to be flexible. But that other trustee has to be truly independent of the beneficiaries. Um, we talked about how having a co-trustee can protect a beneficiary. The other thing that that people always complained about in the old days about trusts is, you know, the trustee is some institution or some lawyer and, you know, they never talk to us and we don't know what's going on and, but we're stuck with them unless they really screw up and we go to probate court and try and get them kicked out. We're stuck with them. Well, now the way we write trusts is we give the beneficiaries the power, usually, to remove a trustee and replace that trustee with another trustee who's truly independent. So they can't go out and hire their college roommate or their brother-in-law or that kind of thing, but they can replace bank X with bank Y, lawyer A with lawyer B, or whatever it is, as long as the replacement is truly independent. And that goes a long way toward making people feel comfortable that in, mom and dad left a trust for me instead of giving me the money. Yeah, maybe they didn't trust me completely, but I see why it was maybe a smart thing for them to do. And I can live with it because the other trustee has enough flexibility to make it work for me. Now, the last thing before we get to questions is what does all that cost? to run, right? So we talked about the fact that the trustees do three things. They invest the assets, they make sure tax returns get filed, and they work with the beneficiaries on distributions, and in the course of that, they prepare what we call accountings, which say this is what happened with the assets this year, and they tend to report that in one fashion or another. Now, if you went to most banks to get a trust, 
they would do all of that in-house. They do all that stuff in-house. And they charge a rate based on the value of the assets that are in the trust. And the rate starts at a percentage for the first X amount and then a smaller percentage for the next amount and so on and so forth. So it scales down the more your, your value of your trust goes up. But it wouldn't be uncommon, for example, and you can ask any of the big financial institutions that do this work and they publish their fee schedules. So, for example, you might see 1.25% of the value of the assets on the first $2.5 million worth or something like that for all of those services bundled together. And then if there was another million, it might be 0.95% on that and so on and so forth. So that's what the institutions do. Uh, professionals tend to do the same thing, but they may parcel out some of those other services. You know, when Heather or I serve as a trustee, we don't do investing. You know, it's not our thing. We hire professionals to do it and they charge an investment fee and we reduce our fee by the investment fee, usually. So you, you try and stay within that bundle. Some of us also do our own tax returns in-house. Some trustees hire accountants to do the tax returns. One way or another, you know, yes, trusts have costs every year, but you have to weigh the costs against the benefits of them, both from an estate tax savings perspective and from a protection of your beneficiaries perspective. And most folks that adopt trusts find that they're willing to pay something to have that tax savings and protection. And I think with that, we're gonna turn it over for questions and I hope you have a lot of them. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Heather. Just want to give them a round of applause. They did a great job. <laughs> um, we've reached the portion of this session where there's questions and answers. I'm going to ask you to state your question, and then one of the panelists will answer the question, but I'm going to ask the panelists to please repeat it so that the audience can hear the question. Oftentimes, the audience can't hear. Uh, yes, sir. I was just wondering, uh, and perhaps this has been gone, someone went into this past two sessions, I'm sorry I wasn't here, I'm, I'm really sorry now, I think I missed a lot. Uh, but uh, often these uh, trusts, etc., you hear about them being used uh, in the context of Medicare, Medicaid, nursing homes, etc., etc. I don't know if you've gone into that yet, is that, how does that work? Maybe, maybe we're talking, it's different in every state, I'm sure. So, How does that work in Connecticut? So the question was, do people use trusts to... Oh, it's not on. Rich, I'm going to ask you to come up here. Okay. I'm going to stand next oh, to you. that's too bad. This is the mic for the TV. This is the mic for the room. So the question was, do people use trusts to address uh, the fact that they might need Medicaid or Title 19 someday right, for their long-term care expenses? And that's... a uh, a completely specialized type of trust. I would venture to say neither one of us dabbles in that. Mm -hmm. you, you tend to want what we would call an elder law specialist to do that. But you're lucky because you're going to hear from them in the fourth session. <laughs> so yes, you time. can use trusts sometimes to protect yourself from Medicaid. You can definitely use trusts to protect your kids, for example, if you had a disabled child, we would, we would, this we do, we this would we know do. <laughs> how to write a trust so that the assets that were there were not counted as the child's assets when they were deciding whether they qualified for Title 19 or not. But the last session will go into that stuff in pretty good detail. Correct. Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, if you know that the value of the estate will be under $2 million and you don't have children that you're worried about. Is there a need for a trust? What would that do? 
Heather? Sure. So the question was, if you have a value of your estate of under $2 million and you don't have children that you're worried about, would there be a need for a trust? And so for we look at the two reasons, as Rich described, for, you, for trust. So the first one would be for estate tax purposes. So if your total assets are under $2 million, then if you're married, you don't need to utilize the first to die's $2 million exemption because if the survivor inherited everything, the survivor would still be within his or her $2 million exemption. So we wouldn't need to use a trust for estate tax purposes. So then if there are no children to worry about in terms of protecting them from outside forces or from themselves, then you may just choose to leave the assets outright to your beneficiaries. Um, is there anything else that you would add to that, Rich? Um, the only thing I would say, c can you hear me if I use this? No. Speak, okay. speak, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stand up here. Or, or really speak loudly. <laughs> so the only thing I would say is today, two people might not have assets worth $2 million, but it sometimes happens that somebody dies young and the other spouse lives a long time. And over that long time, the assets get to be more than $2 million. Um, so, you know, I said before, we plan for the possibilities, not the probabilities. So we always look at what the facts are today. And if you're not that far from two million, we might suggest that you do that anyway. Because if somebody died and somebody else lived a long time, you know, you don't know how big that estate's gonna get. But you may not need it, so. Okay, I'm just gonna, um, yes ma'am. Um, you talked about um, children and divorce and the trust. Mm -hmm. Does that have to be set up before they get married? The child gets my child would get married? So the question is, we talked about children and divorce, and does the trust need to be set up before the child gets married? So when I was describing those external and internal risks, I was focusing on after the death of the survivor, if you're married, after the death of the survivor of you, when you're going to leave the assets to your children. So that passage of assets won't happen until your death. So the trust does not have to be in existence at the time the child is married. But at the time the assets are transferred, they can't touch the child's hands, as kind of Rich was saying, things that you own are then exposed to your creditors. So the trust would need to be created by you or the structure set up by you during your lifetime so that at your death it could spring into being and protect those assets for the child. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Wow, we're getting pretty sophisticated. <laughs> That's a good one. Luckily, I have the answer. The question was, could I explain, could we explain what a disclaimer trust is and how that affects the use of the $2 million Connecticut estate tax exemption? So we might talk to Alan and Susan and say, you know, you should divide up your assets so that when the first of you passes away, you put up to $2 million in this trust so that you know that that will not be subject to a state tax again. Now, we've all heard that maybe kind of, sort of, in the Connecticut budget, the Connecticut exemption might go up to equal the federal exemption. But who knows, right? So what some people do is they say rather than hardwiring that use of the first spouse's exemption and you know, knowing that there'll be a trust there, if the only reason we want that trust is for the estate tax savings, we're not worried about our beneficiaries, then what some people will do is we'll, they'll say, you know what, I'm going to leave everything to my spouse, but I'm going to give my spouse the ability to disclaim and I'll explain what that is. But if my spouse disclaims, then there'll be a trust that gets created. And the advantage of that is that the decision doesn't have to be made today when they come to us to write the trust, 
the decision can be made when the first person passes away. They can then decide if they want to do a disclaimer or not and fund the trust. Now, so a disclaimer is something that you essentially execute. It's a formal document. It has to be executed within nine months of the day you die. It's got to be filed with the probate court and in various other places. And it essentially says, don't give me that. Treat that that I disclaim as if I was already dead. Um, but the beauty of that in that context is if your trust says, if my spouse disclaims, then instead of going outright to my spouse, it goes into this trust for my spouse. Then you get the same benefit of using the exemption, but you don't have to make the decision today. You make the decision when the first person passes away. Now, the only thing I would caution is that sounds wonderful, but if you've ever had that conversation, it's very hard to have a surviving spouse in your office a couple of weeks after their long-term spouse passed away and say, you know what, the best thing for you to do is not take the assets. It's not a conversation that tends to work. But can you disclaim in part? You can disclaim single assets, multiple assets, fractions of assets, dollar amounts of assets, so it's pretty flexible. The question was, can you disclaim parts or you know, things? And yes, you can slice and dice that all kinds of ways. Okay. Any questions? I'm sorry, yes. Uh, Heather, you had mentioned something about the code trustee. And you mentioned that if the beneficiary becomes a, a trustee, you want to make them a co-trustee so that they don't have total say about what comes the money out. But you also mentioned that um, you do that so they can also have to see reporting and understand what's in the trust itself. Are you saying that if they are not a trustee, they do not get that benefit? <laughs> so the question had to do with the fact that I recommend a co-trustee if you're naming a beneficiary as a trustee. And I said something about how they then would know what was going on. And very correctly you said, but as a beneficiary, wouldn't they have to know what's going on? Well, yes, to some extent. So if I am the beneficiary and not a trustee, then the trustee is gonna give me maybe an annual report, maybe a quarterly investment statement, um, but not maybe a whole lot of other information. But if I'm a co-trustee, I'm going to meet with the investment advisors all the time. I'm going to get all their recommendations. I'm going to see the tax return. You know, I'm going to do all of that because it's my duty as a co-trustee to do that. So, yes, as a beneficiary, you do see information, but as a co-trustee beneficiary, you'll see more of it and have to see it and deal with it. If I can tell my sibling to stop honoring me about it. Yes, right, exactly. Okay, so <laughs> just, just to follow up on that, if, if a beneficiary had a problem with the trustee or, and had a gripe, they could bring the, the matter into the probate court and ask for a resolution. Assuming it's within probate. Excuse, it, it, but well, they, it can, yeah. they can bring the trust within the jurisdiction of the probate court. They have to ask that the probate court uh, administer, uh, excuse me, take jurisdiction over that trust. And in certain circumstances, the probate court will do that. Can Sound I like. Up a question on that, sure. Did you want to say something? Oh, no, no. Okay. What yeah. about jurisdictions then? My mother passed away in Washington State. I'm trustee for my brother and sister's trusts here, but they live in California in Washington State. <laughs> so if they were to go to probate court, which probate court would they go to if they, if they were to ever challenge that? Right, so the. There are now, okay, so now we're in law school. <laughs> so jurisdiction can be based on different things, right? So sometimes jurisdiction is based on where the trustee is, some which is here because you're here. Sometimes jurisdiction is based on where the beneficiaries are, so they're out there. And sometimes jurisdiction is based on where the trust was created by the grantor, because when, you, when we write a trust agreement, 
we always say this trust agreement is subject to the laws of the state of X, which happens to be the states we practice in, because that's all we know. Um, so that, that is also a basis for getting the courts in that state to take jurisdiction of that trust. So it, the answer, like most of the answers we give tonight, is it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Two questions. Um, so financial advisors have a, a, they can take between half and two and a half percent for managing assets um, based on FINRA, which regulates financial advisors. Is there um, a, a cap and a floor for attorneys that act as trusts? trustees of how much they can take. That's my first question. My second question is... Let's take one at a time. Okay, okay I'll... Yeah, I'll would you like to... Well, no, you, you want to know what attorneys... To different take oh, on. yeah. We had, so the first question related to trustee fees with respect to attorneys in particular, because there are certain limits when financial advisors assess a fee, how much they can take. And so the question was, do attorneys have that same limitation? So we do not have a governing body, as you were referencing with respect to financial advisors that would govern how much a trustee fee an attorney could take. As Rich mentioned, attorneys often do a percentage just like a, a bank or trust company would. Now, many trusts, and I don't think we got into this, but many trusts are super, some trusts are not supervised by the probate court, as I mentioned, and some are. So the probate court would also be supervising a trustee fee to make sure it was appropriate. So although we are not limited by any governing body, we want to make sure that the fee is reasonable with respect to the trust because we are, with the duties that Rich described, we owe a duty to the beneficiaries and one of those duties obviously would be not to charge a fee that um, was unreasonable. Yeah, I that? would say, you know, the other factor is, you know, we're all in business. And so if I decided I was going to charge 5% even though I'm really good, uh, I wouldn't have any business. So, you know, the market forces tend to keep that in line as well. Okay, thank you. And then my second question is... Um, I just wanted to follow up on, on that. The, the probate court does look at the reasonableness of the fees of the, the trustees uh, who come before the probate court, and they look at uh, the size of the estate or the size of the amount of money that they're, they're dealing with, the amount of work uh, that the lawyer or trustee is doing, and so forth, and they, the court will help determine the reasonableness of the fee. So there is there is some guidance there, and the, the lawyers understand that as well, and that they, they uh, try and govern themselves. But if there's complaints, if for instance a beneficiary complains about a trustee's fee, and they ask the court to take jurisdiction over that trust, and the court can uh, can take jurisdiction over that trust, and the court would be examining that trustee's fee to see whether that fee was reasonable. Okay. Thank so, you. What's your next question? Okay, second question. Limited by the amount of people? Is that part of your estate or not? I don't know if that's a trust question, but uh, Heather, oh, yeah, you can answer that question. Not, yeah, we're happy to. So the question was, with respect to the annual exclusion amount, this ability to give fourteen thousand dollars to any person per year. So that fourteen thousand dollars is not part of the estate tax exemptions that Rich mentioned. So that's a freebie. So the IRS says. You can give fourteen thousand dollars to anyone or to everyone in this room, and you do not. Have, <laughs> yay! <laughs> well, I'll take it. Well, I'll take it. You do not have to report that to the IRS on a gift tax return. It's a freebie, and it does not use any of your estate tax exemption. It doesn't eat into the two million dollar exemption that Rich mentioned that you use when you pass, or the federal five point four nine million. So it is a complete freebie. And, and is there a certain uh, one time amount? In addition to the 14? So the question is, is there a one-time amount in addition to the 14? That one-time amount is the either the $2 million for Connecticut purposes or the $5.49 million for federal purposes. It's You either use it during your lifetime or it's there at your death. So let's say you gave you know, $30,000 to a child this year. For example, 14000 of that is your freebie. And then the amount over that eats into your lifetime $2 million exemption for Connecticut purposes, 
so that when you die, you'll have a little less than two million because you used it during your lifetime. So it's a cumulative kind of use. And the way they keep track of that is you're going to file a gift tax return on the amount that's over the, the freebie, as Heather Ideally. referred to. Yes, Ideally. that's the correct way to do it. Yes, sir. Other, <laughs> other, other questions? Yes, sir. So the question was, can you use a trust to transfer that $2 million when you're alive? Um, yes, but it has to be one of those kinds of trusts we said is irrevocable, right? Because if it's revocable, you can change it and therefore you own it. So, but if it's irrevocable, you can't change it, it's carved in stone, and therefore when you put assets in it, you're making a gift. And if you put assets in it higher than the annual exclusion, you're using up that $2 million. And some, so some clients who are quite wealthy will actually do that. They'll go ahead and use up their exemption and put the assets in an irrevocable or irrevocable trust. We use those. I know. We pronounce all these words differently depending on what mood we're in. <laughs> um, but you can make a gift into an irrevocable trust and then Whatever those assets grow into by the time you die, all of that is out of your taxable estate. Uh, yes, sir. Can the speaker say something about income taxation of the trust versus in the hands of the beneficiaries? And also whether this relates to, should I set up three trusts for three kids or one trust for all three kids? Mm. <laughs> So the question dealt with the income taxation of a trust for a child, for example, as opposed to an outright distribution in the child's hands, and then whether that means we should set up multiple trusts or just one trust. But going to the first issue, so and I think as Rich mentioned, the trust is a separate income taxpayer, right? So you've passed, there's a trust for your child. That trust has a separate tax ID number, it's a separate income tax reporter, and to the extent that the income of the trust is kept by the trust and not distributed out to the beneficiary, the trust has to pay tax on that income. The bad, so that's fine, but the bad news is that the trust hits the top income tax rate at a very low dollar amount. Right, right, so it's about $12,000. So many times it's much more beneficial for the trustee to distribute out the income every year to the beneficiary and then the beneficiary gets to pay the tax and report. So in your, to your question of which is better, you can still have a trust, but if you distribute out the income to the beneficiary, the beneficiary can report that, and so the trust won't end up paying tax at a higher rate in simple That's terms. Okay. Is that, okay. But distribution of the corpus would not be taxable. Correct, so we've been talking about distribution of income. If there's a distribution of the actual corpus or principal of the trust, that is a you know, tax-free event. That's just a distribution of principal. There's no income tax associated with that. But, but. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> there's always a but. So the but is that you don't get to decide the character of what you distribute because the rules say every dollar you distribute carries out income until you get past the income, right? And through a very quirky part of the tax law, capital gains, which you all and I all think of as income, are actually treated as principal. So I could distribute half the trust and my beneficiary would only pay tax on the ordinary income, which is the dividends and the interest. And the trust would still have to pay tax on the capital gains, unless it's very specially drafted. So. That's, that's why it's good to have a, a tax degree as well, <laughs> as a law degree. <laughs> there was someone in the back. Uh, someone in the back?
that's part of our test standard. So the question had to do with equality. So I, I think what you may be referring to is the fact that if you don't have a will, and obviously if you don't have a trust, the law essentially writes one for you. It's called the intestacy law. And that generally would give everybody an equal share. But when you write a will or a trust, you're allowed to say whatever you want in that trust. So you could say, Alan and Susan could have said, David gets 40%, Susan gets um, you know, six or 50% because she's got three grandkids, and Richard, because he's a lousy guy, gets 10%. <laughs> and he just blow it anyway. <laughs> So you can do whatever you want in a trust, and there's nobody that can say that's not fair because you write the rules. You're gone. <laughs> did, did that answer your question? Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Back to the, the tax issue. When, when you set up a trust, um, do you have to pay taxes on the trust before the, I may have my turn, so the grantor passes away? It, it depends, yeah. yeah. yeah it depends. So I'm the sorry. question is, do you have to pay tax on the trust before the grantor passes away? And so I think, sadly, it depends. But the, that goes back <laughs> to the distinction between is the trust revocable or irrevocable? So when we were talking about the revocable living trust, that's really your alter ego while you're alive. It uses your social security number, and it's taxed just as if the assets were in your own name. So there's no tax change with respect to a revocable living trust. Okay. Compare that to the uh, gentleman who asked about the irrevocable trust and the transfer of assets as a gift during life to a separate irrevocable trust that has its own identity. That may involve what Rich was talking about in terms of a separate taxpayer. It gets even more complicated. And but if you gave away more than $2 million oh, right, into it, then you would have to pay gift tax. We didn't really talk about gift tax, but gift tax and estate tax kind of go hand in hand. So I think this fell Sir. Another question. <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to ask, one of the uses uh, that uh, the speakers mentioned for a revocable uh, living trust would be to uh, manage assets in the event of incapacity of the grant or, or the, you know, whoever has the assets. Uh, how does that, I, 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 as far as I know, a power of attorney can be granted to do the same thing. How do those two compare? So the question. Would you use one or the other? Yeah, so the question deals with incapacity and that I mentioned that a revocable living trust is one way to allow you to manage your assets in the event of incapacity because you have a successor trustee who can step in to manage those assets. In comparing that to a power of attorney, which I think was mentioned in the last session, which is a document that you grant the ability to manage your finances to someone you name in the power of attorney. So many of you, and we recommend having power of attorneys as well, as well, that's part of the estate planning kind of package that we talk about. The power of attorney allows the person you name to manage assets that you own in your individual name, not trust assets. So we kind of look at those as working together. The power of attorney gives someone you name the ability to access your assets that you own. And the trustee you name in your revocable living trust allows you allows that person to manage the assets in the trust. Sometimes it's difficult to use a power of attorney. So we see circumstances where a bank or under other institution sometimes questions either the validity of the power of attorney or maybe that it's too old or there's, you know, institutions are kind of concerned about their liability in honoring a power of attorney. So the person you've named may run into some roadblocks when trying to use a power of attorney. If you have a revocable living trust and that person is named as trustee, that is a very solid mechanism where they can just step in as successor trustee, then the trust allows them to act and manage those assets. So the revocable living trust kind of takes out that step of having to convince an institution, for example, to kind of allow the power of attorney. 
Is there anything to add? Yeah. Yeah. Just to follow up with regard to the power of attorney, oftentimes uh, in banking institutions uh, refuse to honor powers of attorney, and sometimes uh, on, on occasion uh, the lawyer or the family member will come to the probate court and ask uh, the judge to enforce or to, to uh, uh, force the bank or the lending institution to use or to honor the power of attorney. They should honor it, but they, as Heather explained, they're concerned about liability. They're concerned that the power of attorney may have been extinguished or terminated at some point, and then they've given away assets or allowed someone with a power of attorney to move assets, and they may be liable for that. So they're worried about protecting those assets for the person who owns them. And the power of attorney is only an agent acting on that person's behalf. So they, it can be complicated uh, when using a power of attorney. And, and just to be fair, you know, you've all heard about abuses of powers of attorney. Um, you know, so if I have power of attorney for my mother um, and I convince the bank that it's valid because it is, that doesn't mean I can't go and do something nefarious with her money. And it's easier to do that, I would say, with the power of attorney than it is being trustee of a trust. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know. Then how can you maneuver, if you have a, a trust, but then you also have assets on the side, the power of, uh, the, uh, power of attorney is for those assets, but that those assets aren't in the trust. So then what, who's, who's on first on that one? Well, the, the person who has the power of attorney can, can act, if, if you've given them that power to act uh, in your behalf in real estate transactions, banking transactions, if, if you've given them the, all of those powers, um, they, they would be responsible to you because they have to use those assets for your benefit. There is a statute that allows someone to call that person into court and say, give us an accounting on what you've done with uh, the assets on this party's behalf. And they have to, by statute, account for their, their use of those assets. But I don't know if that directly answered your question. Well, I'm just, the, the question is, uh, the institute doesn't recognize your power of attorney paper. So, and you're saying that the, the, the trustee will be honored, but the trustee doesn't have mm -hmm. those things in the trust. Right. If the assets aren't there, then, the, then it is left to the power of attorney. But the, the, the power of attorney, if it's a valid power of attorney, uh, should be uh, enforceable by, uh, by the whole person holding it. It's just that sometimes they run into complications because the lending institutions, banking institutions, want to protect themselves from liability. They don't want to release money that they shouldn't release because they're afraid of getting sued. I guess that. So, <laughs> and I mean, so what happens a lot is, you know, people do a power of attorney and then 10 years later somebody needs to use it. Right. And that's when the institutions get a little concerned about whether this is really good. Now, there's no concept of stale, you know, in the law, but the institution can be rightfully concerned about a document that granted powers that long ago. Um, so that's a good reason we said way back in the beginning, the judge said, not a bad idea to have your estate plan looked at every couple of years. That's another good reason, because if you just do a new power of attorney every time you do that, then you never have one that anybody could say is stale. So. Uh, there, there are new powers of attorney. The, the legislature has created a new form that all of us are familiar with, and um, it might be wise if you haven't updated your powers of attorney to, to do that at this time. Um, but yes, sir. The power of attorney is upon death, that power of attorney is null and void, right? right. And also during the, irre the revocable trust becomes irrevocable upon death as well. So then you, at that point you get another federal tax ID if you get to keep the counts open. That's, those are all things that happen as well. I'm gonna handle the power of attorney question. <laughs> the power of attorney is extinguished upon death. No one can use their power of attorney if the person who gave it to them has passed away, it's gone. Uh, the trust question, I'll let uh, uh, Attorney Marone or Attorney Rhodes handle. No, so you were correct on all accounts. So, <laughs> um, so you were, suspect you went to law. Yeah, there. Experience. <laughs> <laughs> so a revocable trust becomes irrevocable upon death because 
you've now passed it, you can't change it, and at that point it gets a separate tax ID number and becomes a separate taxpayer. Yes. And the bank says you can't do anything until you get a new account. Right, and the bank says you had to establish this new account with a new tax ID number, and yeah. don't talk to me until you do that, right? That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. Been there, done that. <laughs> Further questions? Um, yes, ma'am. One second. Um, the question was, if your estate's a lot smaller than $2 million, do you recommend a trust? So you don't necessarily need one for tax reasons, but you may still want one to protect your beneficiaries or to, to protect against the circumstance that you yourself get incapacitated. Because, you know, I sometimes tell my clients, you know, you can drown in an inch of water, right? if you're unconscious. So it doesn't take a heck of a lot of money in the hands of some beneficiaries to really ruin their lives. And the trust can help prevent that from happening by you know, monitoring what they get and making sure they don't have it all at once. You know, the, there's no Ferrari in the driveway. If you're <laughs> Richard has a Ferrari. No, no. <laughs> you're not that no, guy. No, no that I met Richard. that rich. <laughs> Ma'am, you had a follow up question you, you wanted to ask Attorney Moreau? Uh, yeah, so um, with a successor trustee, this is like if the, if the grantor, who's also the trustee, becomes incapacitated, the successor trustee can take over. What, is there a burden of proof? How, yeah, it's a good question. So the question is, if, for example, to paraphrase, if I'm the trustee of my own trust and I've designated Heather to be my backup trustee if something happens to me, how does has she prove that I'm incapacitated? So the trust agreement generally says, go get my doctor and maybe another doctor to say that I'm no longer capable of managing my affairs, and then Heather will have the authority to take over because the doctor will have signed off on it. Or you can resign from the trust. Well, yeah, but if I'm incapacitated, I'm not likely to be resigning. I'm likely to be fighting you, saying I'm fine. Right. <laughs> and I'm pushing him out of the way. But. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I think it, uh, it was maybe even this year. It's been yeah. changed every year for the last. It's been changed. Yeah, yeah. So there's been a few iterations of that update, and I believe the last one was I think it went into effect October of 2016 was the, yeah. the most the big, updated. The, the big, big change, change was 2015, was 2015 right? Your prior powers of attorney are still valid. Yes. So the Power of Attorney Act did not invalidate any powers of attorney signed before. It just added some new possibilities of powers that you can grant to your agents. And it provided some enforceability, as Judge Egan was saying, with respect to institutions who um, are squeamish about accepting the power of attorney. We can really force them to accept it now. So that was a very important point, that the old power of attorneys, even, even the one that Attorney Marone referred to, uh, is still valid. The t t power of attorney that's 10 years old is still valid. You might have difficulty having someone enforce it. Sometimes they'll, they'll ask the person who made the power of attorney to sign off and say, I haven't revoked this. I've seen banks ask for that. But if the person's incompetent, that becomes very difficult. Uh, so it's very important that you have uh, the power of attorney, and it may be an old one, but it's still it's still valid. You just would probably have to consult with your attorney, and then have the him or her tell you which direction to take. So, we we have time for just a few more questions, uh, sir, in the back. Say it again. Yeah, the doc, you know, the your state gets filed in probate, mm -hmm. and then you know a docket number is filed to it, and then the trustee passes on. So what happens to in probate at that time? Do you have to assign a lawyer to handle it, or the, the estate? The estate is filed, and there's a there's money is transferred to a trust. Then every, there was no other beneficiary, what would be 
Okay. That's the right answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. It's a good question for Heather. Yes. yes. So the so the question is whether or not you have a trust. Does your estate go through probate, and is there still a fee? So the short answer is yes. The probate fee is assessed on every estate, whether there's assets in your own name or all the assets are in a revocable living trust. Every estate is assessed a fee based on the total assets that you own in your own name and that are owned in your revocable living trust. So the question is, the only reason she's thinking of having a trust is to maximize the federal and state state tax exemptions because it still goes through probate. So technically, the assets, if, if you have a revocable living trust that owns assets before your death, they won't technically go through the probate process. So, so Judge Egan wouldn't have to do anything with respect to those assets, but that doesn't save any of the probate fee. Okay, I think this is important. Yeah, so, and we hear kind of those advertisements, you know, do a revocable living trust save on the fee. Right. That doesn't make any difference with respect to the probate fee. The Connecticut mm -hmm. legislature set up this tax system that Caption. taxes any of those assets. Last question. Anyone else? Sir. Can you say something about how estate tax applies to pre-tax assets? And then you have IRAs and 401ks. If I have three million, pre-tax, that's really not three million. Do I get taxed on the whole thing? So the question was, if I have assets that will be subject to income tax someday, do they get estate tax the same way as any other asset? And the short answer is yes. Um, but the, the more complicated answer is that if you, um, if your estate was big enough to pay federal estate tax, then the person who received the asset and had to pay income tax on it would be able to deduct the estate, the federal estate tax that was caused by that asset. So there's a bit of an offset there. It's not be dollar for dollar. From the state tax right. Tax? So if let's just say you had a really big estate and you had a million dollar IRA. And that was, you know, you had an $8 million estate, you had a million dollar IRA, so your recipient, your name, your child is the beneficiary of that. That million dollars is subject to 40% estate tax, and then when your child takes it, it's subject to pretty high income tax, right? But your child would be able to deduct the portion of the 40% federal estate tax that that asset was subject to before it got to him or her. Subtracted from the tax From the your state. income tax. So I would get a deduction for the estate tax that was paid on that asset. When you paid income tax. When you pay income tax on it. So if I took the whole million dollar IRA, paid income tax on the whole thing, I would also get a deduction for the $400,000 of estate tax that was paid on it. Okay. Are we talking federal now? Federal only. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. What if it was a Roth IRA? <laughs> so the question is, what if it was a Roth IRA? Are we out of time yet? Um, we, we, we actually are. <laughs> uh, the, so the Roth IRA isn't subject to income tax when it comes out, but it's still subject to estate tax like any other asset. It's just that when your recipient gets it, they pay no income tax, so there's no deduction for the estate tax. Okay, that, that, that's going to wrap it up. I, I just wanted to remind you that there's uh, one other session, November 1st, Conservatorships and Title 19. Please join us for that. Uh, I want to thank our panelists, Heather and Richard. Great job. Thank, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.